The following lesson is linked to learning outcome four, language. It addresses the assessment standard that requires learners to use structurally sound sentences in a meaningful and functional manner. Learners should be able to use a range of figurative language such as idiom, idiomatic expressions and proverbs with developing appropriateness. Hi, I'm Charlotte. Today we are continuing our lessons on figurative language and by now you should have a firm understanding of what figurative language is. You should also be able to identify and interpret different types of figurative language. Now before we carry on with today's lesson, let's quickly recap some important concepts. Figurative language is language that has a deeper or hidden meaning. The surface or literal meaning of the words is not the writer's intention. We have already looked at figures of speech that involve comparison. Do you remember what they are? That's right, we examined similes, metaphors and personification. Here are some reminders from our previous lessons. I'm sure that you recall Pete's pig-like eating habits. And what about the dancing leaves? We also learned about figurative language that involve sound devices. I'm sure you will recognize these terms as soon as you see them again. Always look out for the use of sound devices in advertisements, newspaper headlines and comic strips. You have no doubt realized that there are many different figures of speech that add to the richness of language. The figures of speech we will be looking at today are mostly used in a playful manner and can be a lot of fun. But this does not mean that it's not important. It could quite easily appear on an examination paper. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to identify and understand puns, rhetorical questions and euphemisms. You might not realize this, but you have been exposed to puns quite frequently and should be used to them. Now let's define the term first. A pun is a clever play on words which has the same sound but different meanings. The double meaning in puns is used to convey humour. Puns are frequently used in newspaper headlines and advertising campaigns to grab the attention of their readers. Puns are also often used in jokes and riddles. In order to identify a pun, it is assumed that the reader or listener has a firm understanding of what is going on in the world around them. Now let's look at this newspaper headline as an example. Nob Kiri gives clout to Parliament. If we examine this headline for its literal meaning, it means that somebody has given the Parliament a good smack with a traditional weapon. Now I'm sure that you will agree that this grabs the reader's attention. This headline is used to entice the reader to look closely at the article that follows. The article deals with a new design for the mace, which is traditionally a fancy baton carried by kings as a symbol of power, used in the South African Parliament. The knob kiri is used as a conversational reference to the new mace. The pun, however, lies in the word clout. The word clout can have two meanings. Clout, the verb, to hit, or clout, the noun power or influence. So this headline carries the figurative meaning that the newly designed mace adds power to the South African Parliament. Are you starting to understand how puns work? Now let's look at the clever pun used in this advertisement. Can you identify the pun? That's right, the pun is on the word buck. A buck can be a type of animal but it can also conversationally refer to money. Here the advertiser is implying that money is becoming a rare commodity. Clever, isn't it? Now let's have one last look at an example of a pun. And for this, we go to the theater. Ask for me tomorrow and you shall find me a grave man. This is a famous line from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Let's look at the line again. Ask for me tomorrow 
and you shall find me a grave man. In this scene, Mercutio is badly wounded and dying. Can you identify the pun? The pun is on the word grave. The word has two meanings. One meaning of the word grave is serious or solemn. The other, of course, is a place in which bodies are buried. Mercutio uses the word grave as we would use the word serious, but clearly he means that by the following day he will be dead. Shakespeare uses this pun as a way to emphasize the tragedy that occurred. Now the next figure of speech we will look at is the rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a question for which no answer is expected. If you think about it, you will realize how commonly used rhetorical questions are. Let me give you an example. If your mother is really angry at you and she asks, Do you think I'm your slave? I think that you know from experience that it would be silly to try and answer the question. You would be in a lot of trouble if you had to say anything. This is an example of a rhetorical question. Rhetorical questions are also used very effectively in public speaking. If a speaker is delivering a speech about the stressful lifestyle in South Africa, he or she could end the speech with a question like this. So, ask yourself, does our lifestyle help us become happier people? Because each person's lifestyle and what makes them happy is a very subjective matter, there is no definite answer to this question. However, the speaker does not want an answer, but rather to provoke thought and to get the listeners to ponder the validity of the question to them. Although rhetorical questions are effective, don't overuse them as this detracts from the importance of what you are saying. It is a good idea to limit yourself to one or two rhetorical questions in an essay. And remember, if you do use a rhetorical question, you are expected to give your interpretation of an answer. Now let's move on to the last figure of speech for today. A euphemism is a sensitive or tactful way of expressing something that is unpleasant or uncomfortable. Euphemisms are often used in a tongue-in-cheek manner. Look at this example. If someone is particularly short, you could say that they are vertically challenged. Or, if someone has received a two-year jail sentence, you could say that he will be a guest of the state for the next two years. You can see that we have conveyed the exact same information, but it has been done in a more gentle manner. Now, in our society, we often use euphemisms for death. We would rather say that somebody has passed away than they have died. Now, it is important to use euphemisms to be polite. But if you do, you have to make sure that the meaning remains clear. To consolidate our understanding of what we have learned today, why don't you try and think of your own original examples of the following. Puns, rhetorical questions and euphemisms. Remember that figurative language enhances English. So next time, when you write an essay or a speech, try and use some of your own original figurative language to enhance your work. Until next time, goodbye.